Come along in the middle of August when it's real hot, then big old nasty things swim around. But, and we rig usually one rig with a 12 out hook. And, I guess y'all saw it, I think I got a big one. One of these, crappie fishing. <laughs> but there's no, it doesn't make sense that if you, you out, you out tackle yourself. You go out and you put, you know, six rigs out and they all got hooks this size. And that day, the only thing that was there was a bunch of six and a half, seven foot, ten foot hammers. And hammerheads have real little mouths and they can't open up very big. He'll never get his mouth around it or it'll be rare for him to. Okay. They like this or that. So the key is, is to get, you know, like many of y'all do, you got to get two or three guys in a boat, two or three guys in a boat, and one guy throws green, the other guy throws strawberry, the other guy throws motor oil until you figure out what's hit. Okay? Throw out there different kinds of baits, different distances, different hook sizes, until you see what's working, and that's what's going to work. Um, That's a real, this kid is a smart kid. He said, is there much difference in how you fish, where you fish, with high or low tides? Let me tell you something. That's probably the number one thing that turns fish on, in my opinion. Barometric pressure is very, very important. But I, surf fishing, tide change. If you're going to go out and you're going to find a day that, I don't care if it's raining, windy. Windy hurts no favor. Fish underneath the water, they got no problem with it. Well, let me tell you something. When that tide is moving in and out, you get two changes, three changes, four changes in a day. That is the best productive day that I can find out in the Texas Gulf Coast. When you have a lot of tidal change. So we have found that we do real well. The best we do on the outgoing tide. On the outgoing tide. When you've had a real full tide and it starts moving out, we do real well with the outgoing tide. We do well with the income. It's pretty good with the incoming tide. My favorite is the outgoing tide. Um, again, you're not going to catch anything unless you're there. But tidal changes is the thing to look for when you're looking at your tidal charts on when to decide to go. Another question? Yes, sir. You know, what type of sharks do you prefer to eat as far as catching uh, out there? What size? Okay, I guess like all of you guys, or anyone of y'all who have caught any saltwater fish have probably hooked into a good old black drum every once in a while. Same thing with sharks. The big black drum, a little squirrely. And you get a fish that's probably bigger than uh, five feet long, six feet, and they start becoming real, real game. Um, I tried to eat a hammerhead one time. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're real hungry. Uh, but black tips, black tips are the best. Let me tell you, um, I'm sure most of you guys like to cook like I do. But you, you can fillet a black tip shark of three to four feet, wrap him in aluminum foil, butter, and garlic, garlic him, and put him over a mesquite fire. There is nothing like it. I mean, it's really, really good eating. But again, I wouldn't eat that black tip that Jay caught at six feet. Okay? I mean, I, I probably would, but it's, I mean, that's not the best and the most preferred shark eating. Three to four footers, you know, two and a half to three and a half feet. That's, that's really a good tasting Another question. Yes, sir. Depends. If you if you're looking at a jack, the question was, what do you do with a jack carvel and how how do you rig him up? Okay. If you've got if you've got this rig, you got this rig right here on a six ot. If you got this rig on a six ot, cut him in threes. Okay. If you got this rig. On a 12 ot, just cut off his tail and put the whole thing up there. Lace him from the back up. And the, what I like to do is I like to get that jack where one hook is coming out of one eye and the other one is just back behind his gills, so that they sit a little bit farther back. Because every once in a while, I used to wriggle like this right by the eyes, but I have found that sometimes those sharks will come in from the side. And if you pick the wrong side, you miss. So it's best to jack put one back just a little bit farther on the opposite side. That's enough. Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
back to the subject on the lights at night. Okay, I know you've seen it on the past big cell plastics we've been to. The guy with the big blue fan, full of drive, yeah. step fan, he's got the porch on the back. Okay, he's I've seen him, he'll set his lights up in the night just to turn them on to go out and wait to set his baits out and then he'll cut the lights off. That's right. And he normally every tournament he'll bring in a big shark. That's right. Okay. We have found that the question was on lights and how do you, when do you use lights and how much do you use lights at night? It's a, it's, a, it's a great, a great question because we have found some people, like I said earlier, some old salts have told me, hey, you drive up with that big old generator, all them locomotive headlights, and those redfish hit the road. Well, I have found that those lights, for me anyway, have done pretty good with game fish. Not, but the question was, is that there's one guy who fishes our tournament every year, he always brings in a big shark, but he never uses lights all night long. We have found that 100% true. Is that if you have got your light shining out in the water, I don't know what it does to sharks, but they will not come in and pick up a bait. So if you've got some of these big lights guys at night and you want to put out a big bait, hey, fish for, fish for, or shine them just real close maybe, and fish close for game fish. But your best bet is to not have any lights facing directly in the water if you've given up your game fishing uh, with your light tackle and you're trying to try and just put bigger baits out and leave them out of the night. Yeah, don't, don't put those lights like Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, any fish. The, the, the number one most successful shark bait in Texas, that's from my own personal poll, <laughs> is whiting. Whiting heads. Let me tell you something. I have caught more fish, more sharks of six foot, seven foot hammerheads, especially because they love those little fish. This size hook, that's not a big hook, guys. This size hook with a whiting, or even, I know it's your something. <coughs> this size, as little as this, as little as this, you can put those fish on the beach with a whiting. Now, and I'll tell you what, you'll find that if you cut that whiting in half, you put out one head to six tails, and the head's going to pick it up every time. They just always pick up those whiting heads. So, if you catch yourself a whiting, and you want to move up from catching, from catching hard hands and small fish, put that bait on there. Now put that whiting on there and throw them out and let them work for you. Let them work for you. Another question? Yes, sir. You know, you're always talking about no show, big show. You always fish farther down, past it, but you know, no, I just don't know. Is it worth going farther down because it's such a hard trip? You asked me if it was a, if it was worthwhile to go past Big Shell. This young man over here told me that they're going tomorrow, but he doesn't have a four-wheel drive. And I told him my advice is don't go past a four-wheel drive, Mark. But but I have done I have caught as many fish at the four-wheel drive marker as I have at the 25 marker. Okay. But you got to get wet. You can't, you can't get out to them from the beach, at the, because because of the grade change in the bottom in the, in the ocean surface. Because it's more gradual, because it doesn't get as deep as quickly. You've got to wade out to that first sandbar and throw from there. And if the tide's really far out, you got to go out even farther. But guys, don't push your luck on going down into Big Shell without a four-wheel drive vehicle. Just get wet and get out in the water. Yes. Uh, Falling back on the whiting for bait, are you wrapping them with uh, pantyhose like a lot of people do with No, uh, you usually have enough whiting, usually when you're down there, that we feel like it's a, it's a more natural, a more natural bait to do it without pantyhose. One thing I have wrapped in pantyhose is if, I, if you take out a big, big bait like a jack or a bonita, and you're going to plan to leave them there for a couple days. You, know, you get there on a Friday, you take a bait out, you're going to leave it until Saturday or Sunday. You can wrap that in pantyhose, and sharks aren't as particular. You know, they, they don't mind pantyhose. I'll do it without. Do it without. Another question. Yes, sir. Structure? Yes, sir. Uh, when you guys get down there, if y'all can pick up a map of the, of the National Seashore, there's several sunken ships along the National Seashore. 
but the most predominant one is the wreckage of the Nicaragua. The Nicaragua sits about 52 miles from the end of the blacktop, and you can still see it in the water, um, especially on low tide. Now, let me tell you, if you don't mind driving 52 miles down the beach, which on some days is, is an hour or two, and some days it's three, let me tell you, that makes for a great place to fish a light tackle. Redfish and trout around, around the Nicaragua, the 52 mile marker, it's a great trip, it's a great trip. If you guys ever get into shark fishing, probably the number one best place for shark fishing along the coast is the 48 mile marker. All my buddies in corporate are gonna hang you for telling you. But the 48 mile marker, what happens there is if you look at a map of Texas, and, you, and at night you can actually sit out on the beach and see the curve in the state of Texas, at the 48 mile marker is right at the heart of that curve. The Tropic of Cancer comes up, and the Gulf tides come in, let me tell you something, all that trash on the beach, that does not come from tourists. It doesn't. It's those, it doesn't. It's those, it's those people out there in those boats. But they, those tides come in and bring all that all that that trash and stuff in there. But the same thing is those same tidal currents also bring the bait fish, bring the game fish, bring the sharks at the 48 mile marker. So in that cup of Texas, the 48 mile marker is the exact part of where those, those tropical tides come up in the state of Texas. So, and, oh, one other thing about structure. Let me tell you something. If you guys ever get the opportunity, has anybody ever been to the Mansfield jetties? I'm supposed to talk about jetty fishing, so I'll do it right now. Okay. Be at the beach. We're working something. Let me tell you. If you leave the four wheel drive marker, 60, well, 59 miles from there, you can't go any farther. And you get down to the Mansfield jetties. The Mansfield jetties are at the very, very end of the National Seashore. Now, if you ever get the opportunity to drive all the way down there and spend a couple of days, you're going to have the opportunity to do a lot of things. If the fish aren't in the surf, you've got the jetties that you can walk out and fish the jetties. If the fish aren't on the jetties and they're not in the surf, you can go back in the channel and fish the channel. You can actually walk back around the tip of that peninsula finger and fish some flats back there. It gives you all of the opportunity to really have an excursion. And now you're really, you know, via the beach, you're 50 miles away from everybody. And that's, I really got to say this before I, I call it a day here, guys, is that going down to Big Shell and going down to, to the beach to do fishing is as much strengthening the mind as it is your fishing talents. Because you get the opportunity to sit around in a natural environment like no other. I mean, you are so far divorced from civilization that it really gives you some good opportunity. We've been down there and seen big bucks, coyotes run rampant, uh, a, lot of, a lot of wildlife, a lot of wildlife. You're really getting on into a real good excursion get a and mixing it in with the right. Any other questions? Yes, back here. Yes, sir. That's a great question. The guy says there's a thing called the blue hole. 28 mile markers. You know how far off the shore it is? It's just the opposite of what you were talking about earlier, where the avenues come in. There's just no, no cut. Down. That's a good. That's a good thing to know. And what this gentleman was saying is a place called that he's heard called the Blue Hole around the 28 mile marker. That whole coastline changes all the time. And where that may be there today, and it'd be a great fishing place. What he's talking about is deep water right near the shore. And that's the that's the big advantage of Little Shell and Big Shell is you're throwing it deep water right off the shoreline. Okay, where it may be at the 28 today. Those, those kind of natural structures and developments move up and down the beach. It may be at the 30 in a year, or maybe back at the 26 in a year or two. So you've got to kind of keep up with those kind of things. Okay, anything else? Questions, questions, questions? Yes, sir. I know you started off with beer fishing. What's your best beer fishing? 
Well, you know, in the old days when Boswell Pier used to be the real monster pier, 13, 14 foot tigers, tarpon off of Boswell Pier, I still think it's the best pier out there. But the biggest problem with most people is, is that they're rigged up. You can't, we're talking about pier fishing, guys. You can't go to a pier with eight pound test and think you're a real sportsman. Okay? What happens? Fight that fish, takes line back and forth. You're doing great. Now you get him to the bottom of the pier. <laughs> and you got to get him from there up to you. And he's on eight pound test. And he's kicking and jerking. Okay. The biggest problem with people when they're, when they're pier fishing, I like to use this rod. Get up to at least 17, 20 pound test when you're pier fishing. Okay. 20 pound test. Because you're going to have to horse that guy up the side of that pier. The next thing is, let me tell you something. A lot of people say, okay, well, look, we're going to go out and we're going to catch trout and redfish on the pier. Where do you go? Out to the end. Wrong. Nope. That's right. I told, I told you guys that you want to catch trout and redfish, throw on the bars. That's right. Drop right. it on the edge and the drop offs. I mean, you guys talk about drop offs all the time in freshwater fishing. Structure and drop offs. Same thing. Okay? So, you, But this way, you, will, you walk right along and you say, there it is. And you're on top. It's not like being on the beach having to throw to it. But work your bars just like you do from the surface. Okay, there's no reason to take you know, a little piece of shrimp about this big and go drop it off the end of the pier. Two, one or two things are going to happen. Either a big crab is going to take your bait or a big fish. And then all your line's going to go away. So it's smarter to, to use your tackle for what it was made for. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. How many pounds of pork you need to go from a big show with kind of tires? Man, what's the minimum size? Like I got a Bronco, what's my tire for? Yeah, I asked a question about driving down to Big Shell. Tires have nothing to do with it. I've seen people down there with little itty bitty tires, and I've seen guys stuck with big, big tires. The thing to do is to go down and learn the beach by, don't go down there and think that you can drive 63 miles when the tide's in and you got a little itty bitty path to run on the beach road because it's smoother, but you've never been in a shell bank before. And you don't know what they look like. And you don't know how to approach them or how to accelerate them. The thing to do is to drive the middle road, get to know what to avoid and how to approach it, then you're set. So my point is, yeah, every, every magazine's gonna tell you, if you go down to Big Shell, deflate your tires and have big oversized tires and all that. Let me tell you something not necessary if you just don't push your equipment into something it's not geared to do. And that is, if you if you stay on the <coughs> trails that have been made by other people, you're going to have a lot better chance at making it through rather than blazing your own trail. So if I have more, like if I don't get knobs and I get more of a highway type trip, round tires. Be good. Fine. As long as you've got four wheel drive, and you try to try to think about where you're going. That's, watch it all the time. You know, you, I mean, most of us go down there, we end up opening a couple of beer cans, and we're driving down the beach or something, and you don't pay as much attention. You gotta pay attention. The best thing is, let me tell you something. The number one rule, the number one rule on the beach is don't drink and drive. Well, let me tell you something. I love to drink. Two things can happen. Number one, you can stick your favorite thing into somewhere where it'll never get out, and that's your truck. And the next thing is you can run over one of those guys running out from a camp, okay? So it's real, real important that if you're driving down the beach that you really got to watch where you're going. Another thing, be aware of other people's stuff. A lot of people, when you go to Big Shell, the great thing about Big Shell is you sit up real high like this, right on the edge of the water. And nobody is going to drive in front of you, between you and the water, usually, usually. But I know a lot of people that they don't go down to Big Shell. So they say, well, okay, the tide's going to come into about here, the road's over there, I think I'll camp here and put my rods out and stick them right here. Well, they got all these lines running out across the road, across the beach, and into the water somewhere. And you come tooting along, and you got your rods sticking out of your truck or just your truck, and all of a sudden, talk about people jumping out of trailers. <laughs> I mean, they think they, all their lines are on. 
you know, one time and you're dragging them down the beach. So you really got to be, you got to be aware of, of uh, people's campsites. And those yes, sir. Is there a number to get a hold of the surf cats? Or a person to get in Let contact think with? Number <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me share something with you guys that you all might like to enjoy. Every October, uh, I am no longer with those guys. Uh, a friend of mine, Gilbert Flores, and I started a club of seven guys called the Surf Cats of San Antonio. And the first year, we put out flyers on my little Xerox at the office, and we had 83 guys fishing our surf fishing tournament. Last year, we had 500 guys. And it cost a whopping $25 tanner. Now, it's three days of fishing down on, down on Big Shell and down 63 miles of beach. Well, let me tell you something. Really give you an opportunity to see the kinds of fish that people catch up and down the beach. And it'll give you a real competitive environment to be in. And it's the first weekend in October that they have that tournament. And it's Gilbert Flores, so if anybody would like to call on that. Number? 333-0544. Is that local? Hmm? That's local? That's local. Okay, anything else? Last couple questions. <coughs> Back here. Yes. Do you use the gap? Why use the gap? There's something in the fishing regulations about the use of the gap. Can you give me one of those big numbers? They, well, they just, <laughs> let me tell one more story. The, the fishing gap about using the gap. We, as far as I know, as far as I know, it is still legal in the state of Texas to use a gap at any time in landing a fish that's been caught on a rod reel, whether it's on the beach, or whether it's off a of pier or out of a boat. Now, I'm going to leave you with this last story. Last summer, do you guys remember the time when there was seaweed on the beach? Remember all that seaweed came in? Okay. We were in search of blue water, and there was no blue water in the state of Texas except the Mansfield Jetties. Story about the gap. We went down all the way to the Mansfield Jetties, three trucks, just like in this film. Well, it took us eight hours to get 50 miles because it was so, the beach was so bad, there was no road and all that. Well, the last night we were there, I've got this rig out, a little six up, and it took off. Well, we fought that, that, that shark for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and when it got within the light range, I was holding the shark like this. I'm holding the shark and said, she's going up and down. And we said, well, let's go gapping. Here we go. This is the same story like the net. Okay? <laughs> a buddy of mine went out to gaff an eight-foot hammer with a four-foot gaff. Makes no in the dark. Okay? Now listen to this. This is a swear to God, it's a true story. So they're walking out there like this with their four-foot gaff right in this Tiger, I mean, this, this hammerhead is moving up and down the, the weight gun. In the dark, one buddy of mine with a gaff, the other buddy was a little smarter behind him with a flashlight. <laughs> and I'm holding the rod like this, and she's moving like this, right? She's moving like this. All of a sudden, this is a true story. And these two guys are community leader types, and they were real starchy guys, you know, their white shirts and all that. They think they're real cool. And they're walking out there like this, and they're going to they're gonna gaff this shark. Well, I'm holding this line pretty tight because I didn't want to lose her. When they got about from me to this gentleman right here, they're about to gap this, this hammerhead. They were looking at the hammerhead. I was looking at the hammerhead. Nobody was looking at the wave that was coming up behind her. They're about to gap this hammerhead, and this wave came up behind her, and that hammerhead turned right toward them and started swimming. I've never seen two guys run on water any faster in my life. I mean, those guys were downtown. Well, let me tell you, when she came in, this all happened at the same time. I pulled back. This leader came out of the mouth of that hammerhead, and that weight, one just like this, went shooting in the air. Hit the guy with the flashlight right here. At the same time when he got hit with the weight, that shark was right there. He swore to God that hammer had bit him. And you ran, I mean, I've never seen a move that fast. So the point is, when you guys are out there fishing, just try to be careful and have a good time. Thank you very much.